So our speaker today is Maddie Potter, who is a UME Extension uh, Agent Associate for Horticulture and also the Master Gardener Coordinator for Howard County. The overall focus of Maddie's Extension programming is to educate others on sustainable pest management, conservation of beneficial arthropods, and management of invasive species. She received her BS in Environmental Horticulture with a minor in Sustainability and a high honor certification in entomology from University of Maryland College Park. So we're very happy to have a fellow TERP presenting for us today. And she recently finished her master's degree in entomology also from UMD. She's been conducting research in the field of sustainable insect pest management for over five years. And her master's research was focused on the invasive uh, brown marmorated stink bug and included a community science project working with master gardeners as well. So we're happy to have Maddie with us today to present to rake or not to rake, and we're all going to learn some great tips for our fall gardening. So with that, Maddie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks for the warm introduction and welcome. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Everything look okay? Looks good. Awesome. Okay, thank you again for being here this afternoon, everyone. Shout out to my fellow Howard County Master Gardeners. Mm -hmm. um, today we're going to look at to rake or not to rake sustainable autumn gardening. And so as we begin today's presentation, since I'm with the University of Maryland Extension, we always like to, or we always put up this injustice for all poster in our equity statement. And this is just to inform all our participants for any of our programs that if you find that for any reason, this program isn't accessible to you in any way that you can reach out to us or to the contacts listed through this USDA and Justice for All poster. And so you can view the poster here, or I have the link on the bottom right to um, get to this poster and the contact information related. So with that, I recently took this beautiful photo of all these colorful leaves um, the other day, and it just reminded me that with all the colors, all the things that are going on that um, we're tending to see a lot in the media these days related to sustainable leaf management, um, the classic tagline of leave the leaves. Um, and this is good news. I'm glad that it's seeking a lot of attention. I do find that this year I'm seeing a lot more things pop up than last year. These are just screenshots that I took from my Facebook feed recently. So all different sorts of posts from um, other fellow extension pages, master gardener led pages, and even just common gardening blogs. Now, again, this can be great, but it can be a little overwhelming, especially to the general public. There's a lot that can be said. Some might not be science-based, some might be. Um, and so it can be a lot to navigate. Uh, the media tends to sensationalize things, as we all know. Um, another classic example of this happening is with the spotted lanternfly. A lot of information out there can get a little overwhelming and hard to navigate. And so with this, how do we navigate all the buzz? Um, this can be related to today's topic of leaf management and sustainable autumn gardening. It can be related to the spotted lanternfly or anything else going on with the media. And so I just want to begin with some general tips on navigating the buzz. Um, and that includes utilizing credible science-based sources. So if you're creating any sort of educational program or if you're sharing something on social media, I encourage you to stick to those credible science-based sources. So as master gardeners, we are required to use science-based information when we're teaching. So this is just a nice reminder that if we're sharing something on social media, especially, um, it can be nice. We find a blog that we really like, um, but to help navigate uh, all the buzz, it can be helpful to make sure we're using those educational sources um, to help others find the right information. Also continuing to seek out new research-based information. Things are constantly changing. And as we'll discuss today with climate change, um, we need to stay up to date with this information in ways that we can combat climate change within our own spaces and how we can teach others to do sustainable actions. And that leads us to helping others. So helping the general public to navigate all the buzz, 
Um, things are not black and right, white, so we're not going to be teaching people what's right and wrong. We all know better that things tend to be complicated, especially when it comes to our ecosystems, our plants and our animals. Um, but we can point people to credible sources so they can begin to explore the information themselves, or we can begin to design um, different programs that um, may make this information in little bite-sized pieces for people to begin to explore as well. So there's some general tips as we begin today. Um, something that came up for me when I started to research sustainable leaf management and the new and up-to-date tips. So a little overview of what we'll talk about today. We'll begin with climate change's impact on our ecosystems, especially our animals and our beneficial insects. Then we'll discuss wildlife overwintering strategies as we come up into the winter season. How yard waste, if it ends up in our landfills, leads to greenhouse gas emissions. And then we'll spend most of today's talk talking about sustainable autumn gardening actions. So climate change actions we can take. And this answers the why, the where, the how of what we can do and what we can teach others to do. So we generally have our four seasons and here, at least on the Eastern part of the United States, we tend to get to experience all these four lovely seasons. I will say that fall is one of my favorite seasons. It's beautiful, it's peak color right now. I hope you all get a chance to go outside, go on a hike, see all the different colors throughout Maryland. Um, but with climate change, things can tend to get a little bit weird or a little bit different. With uh, global warming, we tend to have longer, warmer seasons. Um, in some areas, harsher, colder seasons. And so with this, I encourage you to stay in tune with your own landscapes and surroundings um, because things are changing. The science can't always keep up. And you're going to know your landscape better than a scientist, particularly in a different state, studying certain things. So always staying in touch with what's happening in your own gardens, backyard, yards, even your balconies with your container plants. Um, and you can always tune in and help the cause, help to move that information forward, participating in things like community science or posting to places like iNaturalist. And so with global warming, as I said, things are always changing and we want to stay in tune um, with these changes and finding ways that we can combat global warming within our own backyards. And this will help us to create more sustainable systems. We can continue to enjoy our green spaces. And with that enjoyment also comes ecosystem services that our plants and animals provide us. And that can include this beautiful scene from a park near my house. Um, to continue to enjoy these green spaces, we need to continue supporting our ecosystems. And so as environmental stewards that you all are, we tend to know a lot about supporting the active stages of our wildlife, such as how to plant a pollinator garden or which plants will attract certain pollinators or to support our native birds. And so, for instance, found this beautiful photo of a pollinator garden that I visited recently supporting the active stages of not only our beneficial insects, but also other wildlife. And it can be super rewarding. Um, I'm sure many of you have experienced when you add a particular pollinator plant to your yard, you begin to see that wildlife popping up, such as our hawk moths, our sphinx moths here on our left. They look like a hummingbird, which is super cool to see. You can see it's long proboscis seeking out that nectar. And then even our bees flying around, all the different species of native bees within our area um, coming to visit our garden and spaces can be extremely extremely rewarding. Now, these are the active stages of our insects. Now, what about the non-active stages? We're going to talk a little bit more about that. And I want to help you to extend your knowledge even further, to advance yourselves to not only supporting the active stages of our um, beneficial insects, but all stages. So we're going to talk about overwintering stages. So we can support those insects that are spending the winter months within our landscapes so that we can have a fruitful uh, springtime. We have all those beneficial insects emerging to be within our ecosystems. Now, why is this particularly important, especially with our insect populations? 
Well, research, recent research has shown with the track we are currently on, we could lose up to 80% of our biomass of important insect pollinator taxa. Now that is crazy. I mean, just thinking about it, this is just our insect pollinator taxa. This doesn't include all the other different types of beneficial insects that are within our systems. So our insects really need our help. Other recent research has published a lot of great graphics and visuals, not only for you to reference, but you can utilize within your own educational programs because I really find that a great visual, um, different art pieces can evoke emotions from the public. And this can help to spark that curiosity and care for sustainab sustainability and supporting our insects. And so this is a great one. Um, it's titled Death by a Thousand Cuts. And um, we can see if we start from the top at interaction disruption, moving from left to right all the way to droughts, these represent all ones um, involved with climate change. And then the ones from nutrification all the way through the bottom to deforestation are typically human led um, disruptions. So we can see all the different factors and things that are going on um, that are working against our insect species and decreasing our biodiversity. Another great visual from this uh, other recent study looked at climate change impacts on insects. And this really great diagram, what they did is they categorized climate change impacts into two main categories. Um, our top one with our blue gradual long-term impacts and then our blue to red colors down at the bottom extreme events. And we can see the columns of change versus the impact it has on our insect species. So another great visual we can reference and utilize. Um, but today I wanna focus on what we can do, the positive side of things where we can be a part of the intervention. So we can see along the bottom, the green part of this lovely graphic the study published. Um, we can be a part of the management and the public participation side of things. We can reduce stressors on our insect species. We can help them to persist and lead to even more ecosystem services for us. So going back to our seasons, right now we are in the fall season and we're coming up to the winter months. Now, where do animals go in the winter time? I'm sure a lot of us know the classic example of bears hibernating. They go into their cave, go into a nice slumber. We may see or remember squirrels and certain birds in the winter time, especially if we have a bird feeder we are filling. But where do insects go and other different types of animals? So here are some examples of Maryland animals in the winter time. And so these are just some examples we see here on the top left, the American goldfinch, one of our native birds, and they are out in the winter time and they need sources of food. And so if you leave your seed heads, particularly for our cone flowers, they like to use these as sources of food. On our top middle, we have our Eastern box turtle, which likes to bury itself in the ground and go into a hibernation type mode. And they'll be buried in leaf litter as well to help regulate their temperature um, so they can be hidden within the leaves. Top right, we have all different types of species of parasitic wasps. So these are tiny, usually tiny parasitic wasp insects that help to sustainably control our pest insects. Um, they attack all different stages of insects depending on that wasp species. This particular photo is a um, aphid attacking parasitic wasp. We all don't like those pesky aphids on our, especially our vegetables. Um, this particular wasp likes to seek out uh, cavities or holes within pithy plant tissue, and they'll remain in there as an adult throughout the winter time. Once it gets nice and warm in the spring, we'll emerge out into our landscape, providing that us that sustainable pest control, which is great. Bottom left, particular bumblebee queen species, newly mated ones will begin to burrow themselves down into the soil, covering themselves with leaf litter. 
really cool. Eastern red bats, a lot of them will migrate south for the winter time, but some of them will stick around depending on how warm or how cool it gets. And if it gets really cool for them, they'll actually roost down in the leaves and begin to cover themselves up with leaves to help them keep warm. So it's like, like a nice little leaf sleeping bag for them to hang out in. And then last but not least on our bottom right, we have Luna moths and they create a cocoon. Um, they're going into their pupation stage. So the caterpillars will go into this leaf litter. They'll use silk that they create and leaf litter and they'll create this nice little cocoon or capsule to stay in through the winter months. So they're down in that leaf litter. They're camouflaged really well because they're using leaves to create this little cocoon and they'll stay there until the warmer months to, to emerge. So we can see that leaves, um, living within the leaves or underneath the leaves is a beneficial habitat for a lot of our native wildlife. We can begin to see that our own landscapes provide habitat and food for our native animals as well. So we're going to return back to this is going to be our example landscape today to begin to visit some of the areas of our gardens, um, our parks, our ecosystems to see what aspects um, we can either identify and conserve or add to begin to fight climate change and support our ecosystems and those animals within them. And so if that hasn't convinced you enough, all the cute pictures of all the different animals that live within the leaves. Another thing that we can begin to think about is uh, the effect of leaf litter within our landfills. And so in the EPA uh, collected this data in 2018, they found approximately 10.5 million tons of landscape debris ends up in our landfills each year in the United States. Um, I know I'm seeing a lot of stuff put on the curb. It tends to be just uh, a usual behavior that we're used to doing. We collect the leaves off our landscape. We either put them in some brown paper bags or some plastic bags, put them on the curb. Now, where do those leaves end up? A lot of them will end up in the landfill. Now, why is this a bad thing? Well, any sort of organic matter that's decomposing in our landfills will result in the production of methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And so this can include not only our leaf litter, but if our yard trimmings and any sort of us uh, like produce, like spare scraps from cooking that we put into the landfill will also produce this methane greenhouse gas. And in 2021, EPA found that methane emissions from U.S. landfills in the year of 2021 um, was the equivalent of approximately 23 million gasoline-powered passenger vehicles driven for one year. So that's a lot to take in. Um, and this is from putting that yard waste, that organic matter, our leaf litter into our landfills instead of keeping it within our landscapes or even composting this material. So we can combat climate change this fall. I wanna move from the doom and gloom, the background information that's really important to know and to teach others about, but moving to the positive side of things, we can be a part of the intervention and we can help to create more sustainable systems even within our own backyards. And we can do this. We're gonna learn about um, different actions we can take today to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by diverting yard waste from our landfills supporting biodiversity, providing winter habitat for food and animals, winter habitat and food for animals, and improving our soil health by leaving or adding organic matter such as our leaf litter and supporting that plant health through improving our soil nutrients. And so we're back to our example landscape, and I'm going to highlight some certain things within this landscape as we move along to learning about this sustainable climate change actions that we can take. So the first thing we'll focus on is actions we can take related to fallen leaf material. And we'll take a look at not only leaf piles, but the leaves that generally fall onto our lawn or our turf grass, composting leaves, and even pine needles as well. 
So we can leave leaves in place, we can create leaf piles, we can use leaves as mulch, and we can compost leaves. So we'll talk about these certain uh, actions we can take in a little bit more detail. And we'll also cover some really cool stories about how leaves are habitat. We visited before a few of our Maryland native animals that use leaves as habitat. We'll get into some more stories as well. And then we'll talk about when we might want to remove leaves from certain areas. So leaving leaves in place. With this, we do want to be mindful of any turf grass or lawn that you or others would like to preserve. Because if we have too thick of a layer of leaves with on our lawn, it can hurt the health of our turf grass. So something to be mindful of. And some general recommendations, um, one from a study in 2018 found that no more than 20% of turf grass lawn should be covered in leaves. Or another general recommendation is no more than one inch deep of leaf layer on your turf grass if you want to preserve that turf grass, turf grass health. And if you're considering reducing the number, the amount of turf grass you have in your landscape, this is a great time of year to maybe pile on those leaves um, and consider taking uh, away some of that turf grass and creating it into more sustainable plantings. An alternative, if we don't want some thick leaf layers all over our landscape or our lawn, is we can create uh, shallow or even really deep leaf piles in certain areas of our landscape. Maybe we don't care about the particular turf grass or plantings right underneath that pile. So we can move this around and I encourage you to sustainably move or gather these leaves. So that means doing it by hand. We can put on some of our gardening gloves, move the leaves, maybe use a reusable bag to move them to certain areas. We can use rakes. Um, and we can use electric powered equipment because if we use any of our gas powered equipment that can lead to pollutants emitted into our atmosphere. So going more toward our sustainable ways of moving these leaves around. Some other leaf considerations before we learn about using leaves as mulch. Things to keep in mind is we want to review our HOAs, covenants, conditions, and restrictions having to do with property maintenance. So just being aware of what your HOA, if you're a part of an HOA, requires in terms of keeping your space clean and if that means removing leaves from certain areas of your landscape always following local municipal yard waste regulations. And something to also be mindful of is with our invasive jumping worms, they can be spread by moving leaf litter around. So that can mean if you know a particular area of your landscape's infested, if you move leaf litter from that area to another area, you might be moving those invasive jumping worms. Or if you're sharing leaves with a neighbor a garden, um, a community center, being aware that you wanna make sure you don't have jumping worms within that particular area of your yard uh, before you start spreading those leaves around. So just something to be aware of. Using leaves as mulch. So this can be a really great free and natural source of mulch. Um, it helps to conserve soil moisture, can prevent soil erosion, suppress weeds, and even protect against extreme temperatures um, for our plants throughout the winter time. General recommendations is three to six inches deep on our vegetable vegetable beds, especially if we're not using any sort of cover crop that helps to protect the soil, add nutrients back into the soil. So when we're ready in the spring to start growing our vegetables and produce and herbs again, that will have those nutrients mixed in. Another general recommendation is two to three inches deep layer of leaves around our perennials or other sorts of plantings. Um, being aware of matting. So thick layers of whole leaves and sometimes get matted down and it traps a lot of moisture, which can either be a good or a bad thing, depending on the circumstance and the type of plant that we have. So being aware of too much moisture, which could lead to crown rot. So again, being aware of our own plants and their preferred growing conditions. Pine needles can be a great alternative if we're worried about matting with our um, deciduous leaves. 
Um, these pine needles can be a great way to add mulching without that matting going on. I won't get into this too much, but it is a myth that if we add pine needles to our soil, that'll raise the acidity of our soil. Um, you can look into it yourself, but rest assured, if we add lots of pine needles to our soil, it's not going to raise that acidity. And we want to keep leaves from touching plant stems and trunks. Um, again, just managing the moisture levels, um, keeping the overall health of our plant um, in check. Um, but still, leaves can be really great sources of mulch, especially if we do want to break them up into smaller pieces. That will help with the matting that we might experience. And this is just a photo showing um, pine needles used as mulch within this particular landscape. We can also compost our leaves. And so if we have a compost pile already within our backyards or within our community gardens, we can add in leaves as those sources of browns. So if we know about composting, we know we have greens that we add into our compost pile and then we add in browns as well. So dried leaves fall into this browns category. And the general recommendation for our compost piles is one part greens to two to three parts brown. And so that's if we're mixing in greens can be yard trimmings or any of our uh, scraps from our kitchen that include vegetable scraps or fruit scraps. Another thing we can do is we can create what's called leaf mold. And it has an interesting name, may sound like a bad thing, but leaf mold just means we're creating a compost pile of just leaves. And so this can be a really great amendment to add to our soil. It can increase soil water retention if we have trouble with that within our landscapes. Um, and to create a leaf mold compost pile, um, you want to make it in a um, enclosed area or at least to keep in the material similar to our typical backyard compost piles. It can be some sort of bin or fencing all the way around. And we generally recommend a height of at least three feet so we don't have things blowing in and out of this compost pile. And it will decompose over a period of six to 12 plus months. As we'll see in our next slide, over a period of years, um, it gets even more decomposed, dark and rich organic material we can use. Some tips, we can break down the leaves into smaller pieces before we add them into our leaf mold or compost pile. We can cover our pile with a tarp to trap moisture and we can turn our leaf pile over every few weeks. And so here's an example of a photo of someone made, um, it looks like with some sort of wire or fencing all the way around um, and stuffed it full of leaves. And so over time that will decompose and create that leaf compost, also known as our leaf mold. And here's a photo of what um, decomposed leaves can look like after a period of three years. So that's a really long time, um, but looks like a really great amendment. Now we'll move into some stories about how leaves are habitat for a lot of our animals. And leaf layer is a primary habitat for all sorts of things like salamanders, chipmunks, wood frogs, box turtles, toads, shrews, earthworms and millipedes, and thousands of insects, I can even say arthropod species, um, live and depend on the leaf layer. And so we're going to focus in on some of these beneficial insects that depend on the leaf layer. Our first story we'll focus in on, and we saw earlier, is the Luna moth. And so the Luna moth overwinters as pupa in these cocoons. So we can see this photo a little bit bigger. We can see how interesting it looks. Almost looks a little paper mache and tanned in the middle. But we can see those little pieces of leaves that they use with their own um, silk they created to create this little capsule or leaf sleeping bag, we can call it. Our next uh, insect is the great spangled fritillary. In this 
particular insect overwinters in its larval stage as a caterpillar. So it stays in the caterpillar form and remains in the leaf litter. So it doesn't create any sort of sleeping bag or cocoon. Um, you may think it's vulnerable this way, depending on where it's situated, right? We wanna take care with our leaves as there may be some of these caterpillars snuggled up underneath the leaves. Bumblebee queens, also something we saw a little bit earlier with certain bomba species. The newly mated queen will find a patch of soil that she can dig in and begin to burrow down into the soil. And the soil will be covered with this leaf litter to help regulate those extreme cold temperatures. And she'll remain there until early spring. Once it begins to rise in temperature, she'll begin to dig her way back out and then find sources of nectar. So this video I found super cool. I put it on a little loop and you can see um, her little bee um, butt or abdomen sticking out there. Um, and you can see that she's beginning to dig down into that soil. Last but not least, we have our surfid fly, also known as a flower fly or a hover fly, a really great predator, also known as a natural enemy within our landscapes, especially at its larval stage, as we can see in our top photo. They look like green caterpillars, um, but they're grubs. This is a particular fly, can be really small, and attacks a lot of our soft-bodied pests, particularly our aphids. So something to look out for in the spring and summer. If we see a lot of aphids on a plant, we might see some of these surfid fly larvae. And so we can see what the adult looks like. They tend to mimic bees flying around, but they just have two wings total, one pair of wings, which makes it a fly versus one of our wasps or bees. And this particular insect overwinters as either larva or as pupa in leaf litter. Now these are really tiny. So we probably wouldn't see this with the naked eye unless we're looking really closely. Maybe we're filtering through some leaf litter could be a great activity to do, especially with young kids. Um, we're using hand lenses, but we can see on the top what this uh, larva looks like, tends to be greenish, can take on more of a yellow color, really small, worm-like. And then on our bottom right, we can see what the pupil looks like, also going to be very small. But we can see no matter the size of the insect, a lot of them are using our leaf litter as their homes um, to be able to survive the cold winter months. And so with this, we want to rethink shredding our leaves. I know that has been a common recommendation, especially as an alternative to removing leaves from our turf grass or our landscape, shred them so they can easily decompose, add those great that great organic matter to our soil. But when we shred those leaves, we're going to harm a lot of the animals that are overwintering within these leaves, like the different insects we went through in their stories. And when we're shredding those leaves, we're also getting rid of habitat for our other animals. If you can imagine using a tiny little piece of leaf isn't as effective as an entire leaf um, that can provide more surface area and temperature regulation for a lot of our animals like our box turtles, our salamanders, and so on. And with our gas powered mowers um, that we might be using to shred these leaves that can also emit pollutants. So just something to be mindful of as we're taking on some more sustainable actions. Now, when might we want to remove leaves from certain areas? If we have too thick of a leaf layer, so there can be lots of leaves falling um, onto our lawn or turf grass. If we don't want that to kill off our grass, um, we may need to remove some of the layers, either relocate that leaves to a different area. We can create leaf piles, moving it to a compost pile or so on. Or we might even need to protect some of our plants that are just emerging. We don't want them covered by those leaves. Another thing is removing leaves from our sidewalks, our streets and roads, gutters, and storm drain entrances. This can be really important for safety. Um, hopefully we haven't experienced this ourselves, but a lot of our leaves, again, they can mat down one on top of the other. If they get really wet, they can be really slippery. So it's important to remove those leaves from our sidewalks and our stairways. 
Um, we want to remove them from our gutters, prevent clogging, so we can have that smooth um, stormwater running through them properly, and to protect our waterways as well. If we have any diseased or infested plants, um, we also want to remove any of that diseased or infested leaf litter. So any pathogens or pests that might be overwintering those leaves um, can be removed and we lower the chance of those happening again in the warmer months. And so what do I mean by protecting our waterways from leaves? Well, if we have too many leaves in our waterways, this can block sunlight. We have a thick layer of leaves on the surface of the water, which isn't great for a lot of the aquatic life underneath. And with leaves, it provides an excess source of phosphorus. So a lot of our fallen leaves have a high amount of phosphorus in them. When we add phosphorus to our waterways, it increases algae growth which is again, not great for our aquatic life. So something to consider, there's been some research done that effective um, street cleaning and leaf management in urban areas um, drastically decreases the amount of phosphorus in our waterways. Um, so there are particular areas we do want to remove leaves from, or at least to relocate them to certain areas. When it comes to diseased or infested plants, um, if we have diseased leaves, they should be bagged and removed. Um, some particularly susceptible plants that tend to get a lot of pathogens, or they're at least uh, more common for these plants, include things like roses, peonies, and fruit trees. So just being aware of um, your plant's health. One example is sycamore anthracnose. Um, this can overwinter in the diseased leaf litter and spread to the tree once again to reinfest the tree or nearby trees come spring. So we recommend with that, if you know your sycamore has anthracnose, to remove any of that diseased leaf litter from the landscape. If we're talking about different pests, insect pests, if a plant has a history of heavy pest pressure each year, seeing the same insect pest species coming out, we want to look into its life cycle. And this is a part of integrated pest management, IPM, sustainable pest control, looking into that pest life cycle. Once we've identified that pest, if we need help with that, we can reach out to our extension specialist, UMD Ask Extension website, we can help you identify that pest. We may find that particular pest overwinters in leaf litter. In that case, we do want to remove the leaf litter to hopefully decrease that pest population come spring. And one example is our pest, the flea beetle, which tends to attack our eggplants. If we see those tiny little chew holes throughout our eggplant, it could be our flea beetle, and they do overwinter within the leaf litter. So if we find each year we have a lot of flea beetles, we recommend to remove that leaf litter below those plants um, to decrease their populations. So we talked about sustainable actions and considerations with our fallen leaves. Now we're going to look at sticks, logs, and rocks. So some of our unalive material that could be great habitat as well. And with our sticks, we can create brush piles. And this can be a protective pile of dead plant materials. Um, being mindful, we probably want to put those larger branches on the top bottom and begin to pile up with our smaller branches. And this is a great shelter for all different types of birds, mammals, insects, and more. Um, if we have space with this for this within our gardens or our landscapes, um, we can find a particular area um, where this sheltered brush pile will be protected. We do want to make people aware that this isn't a source of burning or setting something on fire. A lot of people like to set brush piles on fire, but we want to make sure that we don't have any of our fellow animals inside, um, particularly those really small insects that we can't see. And I also recommend we don't cut any uh, healthy or living plant tissue to create these brush piles. So this is if we have some fallen limbs or we have a plant that we need to prune and we have this plant material that we would tend to throw away or um, to put into our yard trimmings bag, maybe considering creating a little brush pile, a nice habitat within our spaces as an alternative. 
fallen log. So if we tend to find a fallen log near the edge of our garden or our yard, um, within our community garden. Uh, some people might see that as, ooh, we need to move that somewhere else, get rid of it. Uh, maybe it's great firewood, but challenge you to rethink that as it can be great habitat for small mammals and insects. All those little crevices and burrows that fellow insects will make are great homes for all different types of animals and arthropods. And this can be a really great thing to involve the youth with. Um, this is a great place to look for different insects if we're taking care and not destroying their home, but we can peek in, we can even lift that log up for a moment, find lots of different arthropods underneath there, like our roly-poly bugs and our millipedes and our centipedes. And if you can find, I in this photo, there is an insect peeking out. It's fuzzy brown and black, if you can spot it. It's one of our woolly bear caterpillars. And you can find lots of these beginning to find its overwintering home in logs. If you gently lift up some of the bark, make sure to put it back, but you can find a lot of these caterpillars um, finding their homes within these fallen logs. Rocks and rock piles. So if you simply have one rock, we could uh, create a home for lots of different arthropods underneath, or even better, we stack some rocks one on top of the other, creates even more crevices, maybe for small animals like our insects to overwinter and find shelter inside. And this can be a great home, not only in our winter months, but also throughout all the seasons as well. So we looked at six lock, logs and rocks. Now we're going to take a look at grasses, perennials, and flower stalks. Grasses. So we're talking about our native grasses, especially grasses that grow um, in dense bunch forms, like we can see in this bottom right photo, um, can be a great protective habitat for all sorts of animals like our deer, turkey, quails, doves, songbirds, squirrels, rabbits, and all different types of insects. And if we're looking for sources of native grasses that we can add to our landscape, a really great resource for this, and many of you may already have, is our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Native Plants for Habitat, Wildlife Habitat and Conservation Landscaping. Um, has a really great section on our native grasses and grass-like plants. And you can even see there's a column right next to the last column for notes for wildlife. So you can see what type of wildlife this particular grass supports. Super cool. Um, there is a digital version of this resource. And so you can either scan the QR code here or have the link um, linked in the references toward the end of this presentation. So you can view it yourself or share it with others um, to look into some native grasses. Woody perennials and flower stalks. So a lot of us will see the dead flower stalk material and think that it's unsightly and we wanna remove it from our landscape, but I want you to think again, um, because a lot of our woody shrubs and flower stems can be homes to a lot of our native bees, like our mason bees, our leaf cutter bees, our carpenter bees, and a lot of our parasitic wasps. Remembering those wasps that attack our Insect pests provide us with that sustainable pest control. And so um, waiting to prune as late as possible. So not pruning this fall if we can help it, depending on our plant species, of course, but waiting until late spring. And research has even show that waiting as late as June isn't far enough. And so if we have to prune early um, in any sense of a way, I encourage you to take those prune cuttings and to leave them outside somewhere. That way, if we do have an insect inside, that it can still safely emerge out into our ecosystems. And so on our top left photo, we see some uh, Joe pie weed, might it might, what it might be looking this time of year, dried and brown. Some people might think it's unsightly. To me, I think it adds a beautiful texture and color to our landscape. And I also see it as great homes for our beneficial insects. 
top right, we see a mason bee sticking out. Um, we can see its thorax peeking out there as it begins to burrow down into this pithy woody plant tissue where it will remain in the winter time. And then on our bottom, we see this picture again of our parasitic wasp um, that's beginning to burrow into some pithy woody plant tissue for the winter months. And I really love this photo from the Xerces Society. So I gave it its own slide so we can take a look at it. And this is a leaf cutter bee inside of a flower stem. So our native bees and other beneficial insects not only utilize our perennial woody plant stems, but also those flower stalks that we tend to think aren't useful or aren't lending anything to our ecosystems, but they are some terrific homes for things like our leaf cutter bees. And so we can see this is a cross section of that flower stem. In the center, we see this little brown um, piece of leaf circle. So with our leaf cutter bees, they tend to create those little circle cutouts of leaves, and they'll use these to create little chambers. Um, and this time of year, usually the um, female leaf cutter bees will create these chambers and natural openings like our flower stems and lay a single egg inside each chamber with a little bit of food and cap it with that little circular leaf. So we can see here um, a sign of that within this landscape, which is really cool. We'll now move from grasses, perennials, and flower stalks to seeds, such as our acorns, our pine cones, and even more. So we may have noticed that some of our oak trees are producing more acorns than usual. Um, and you are not wrong, it is a mast year for many of us. And what is mast? Mast refers to various nuts fruit, and fruits produced by woody plants and provide great food for our wildlife. In this mass year where a lot of our trees sink up and produce more acorns than usual is usually triggered by climate, a particularly dry and hot summer like many of us have had, followed by a warm late winter. Now, what's really interesting is this mass year is still a great mystery for our scientists and our ecologists. There are some hypotheses that um, this is just a part of their survival strategy. We can think back to our brood X periodical cicada emergence where their um, survival strategy was just to produce a lot of cicadas in the hopes that some will reproduce um, and survive and produce future generations. Could be a similar survival strategy for some of our um, trees that produce these nuts. Every few years, we, they sink up, produce a lot of nuts, and hopefully that means even further survival for their species. So really cool. Um, just goes to show that there's a lot in science that we still need to discover and explore even more of. But all these acorns, they may seem annoying to us, but if we leave them be within our landscapes, they feed over a hundred vertebrate species, such as our squirrels and our birds, like our blue jays. And they're a great source of carbs and fats in the winter time. A lot of animals will stock up on them as early as they can, and they'll continue to forage for them throughout the winter months. Birds and squirrels will also feed on pine nuts from our pine cones. And what's really cool is I recently found um, research that's being done in Washington state, which found that certain spider species utilize pine cones as their niche habitat. Now that's super cool. Um, and gave it its own slide. I wanted to show how this cobweb spider lives inside pine cones. And um, we can see some of the photos of this particular spider. It has pretty cool coloration with these browns and tans. Um, and from this research, they were able to publish a paper and they found 88 other spider species that were also utilizing pine cones as habitat. So it just goes to show arthropods are everywhere and every part of our landscape can be a home to another animal. So 
flower seed head. So we're learning to leave our flower stalks, but we also want to leave those seed heads as well. So they're not only going to help reseed our native plants for next year, but they're also going to feed a lot of our wildlife that are sticking around and they're active during the colder season, such as our birds, like our goldfinches, as we can see with this video, goldfinch uh, munching on some coneflower seeds, chickadees, cardinals, sparrows, and more um, feeding on those nice dried seed heads. And here's a video I was in my parents' garden. They grew some coneflowers this year. And we can see me brushing off some of those seeds from the dried seed head. And so this is a great time of year to collect seeds if we would like. And this is a great way to spread those seeds around your landscape and to also share seeds with others. I know there are a lot of great seed shares that happen throughout the year. In Howard County, we're planning one with our public library system in January of 2024. And so you want to make sure that you know the identification, the scientific name of your plant while you're collecting seeds from it. Um, that's why we usually encourage to start early. So while it's still in flower, you can identify your plant. Um, and then to collect some of the seeds. We want to keep some of the seeds there in the seed head to reseed for next year and to also feed our wildlife. So some of us like to cut off that seed head completely. That can be fine if we do it sparingly, but I encourage you to collect some of the seeds and leave some of the seeds there for our wildlife as well. So we took a look at our acorns, pine cones, and more. And it just goes to show that all different parts of our landscape, maybe things we haven't considered before can help support our sustainable ecosystems. Things that we can already recognize that exist within our landscape, thus we can move to conserve those particular things or I'd, different aspects that we can add to our landscape as well. Maybe adding a native bunch grass or adding some cone flowers next year so they can be nice dried seed heads for the winter time for our songbirds. You can make a difference. So we learned about all these different sort of autumn gardening sustainable actions that we can take to combat climate change to help our wildlife. And you can make a difference. Starting this year can make a difference. And there's really cool research that's being done from someone from the entomology department at the University of Maryland, Max Frilato, who's a fifth year PhD candidate, has been doing research on the effect of different leaf litter management on arthropods. And what he found in his preliminary results is that in sites where leaf litter was usually removed, so historically each year that leaf litter is being removed from this particular site, after just one year of retaining that leaf litter, it increased moth and butterfly emergence come spring. So that's really cool that even after one year of leaving that leaf litter, it makes a difference for our butterfly and moth populations. And so if you want to learn more about Max Filato's research, um, I encourage you to reach out to him. And he's um, been giving a lot of really great continued education talks to not only our master gardener groups, but other organizations as well. With this, we can do all these sustainable actions within our gardens and landscapes, but another really impactful thing that we can do and that we all are are already doing as science communicators is to find ways to spread the word. And this can be one-on-one -on -one conversations with our family, friends, and neighbors, community members. We can use really cool signs, flyers, and posters. Art is a really great way to communicate science to the public. Um, there is a picture of this sign here, Leave the Leaves from the Xerces Society, that I believe can be purchased or printed out. I've seen some really cool Leave the Leaves signs from local artists that we can support of um, these beautifully drawn animals within leaves to communicate that message. We can do presentations like I'm doing today. Um, we can invite out people like myself to come speak to different groups, or you can create your own presentation based on this information um, to spread the word. We can do videos, blog posts, social media posts, 
Um, if you have a Facebook page for your Master Gardener group, the Xerxes Society has some um, pre-made um, leave the leaves taglines with a nice photo of some um, animal that utilizes leaves in the hashtag leave the leaves that you can repost um, spreading that word and also utilizing engaging activities. Um, learner centered strategies where we're meeting people where they are with their information and also learning from them what their goals are for sustainability in their landscape, meeting them halfway with that and finding ways that we can have them move toward these more sustainable actions. Um, creating crafts and workshops to teach them about this key information that we want them to know. So what did we learn today? Um, we learned many things, but one of the main things that I wanted to point out and for you to take away is the significance of utilizing credible sources and staying informed. So you can give yourself a pat on the back today. You've sought out some um, information on sustainable autumn gardening today. That's excellent. Uh, the importance of supporting all life stages of beneficial insects and wildlife amidst climate change. How different wildlife overwinters, their different overwintering strategies. We learned about that. The negative impact of yard waste and landfills, how this can produce um, greenhouse gases. And so the importance of diverting leaf litter and yard trims from our landfills. And then the big one, all the different things we learned today about sustainable actions we can facilitate in our landscapes this autumn, combating climate change, doing great things to create more sustainable systems for our current generations and future generations to come. Now I wanna take a moment here, um, hopefully we'll be able to put up our quick little poll for you. I want you to take a moment and you might be sitting near your own landscape yard or your container garden as well, or you can begin to think about your demonstration gardens, your community gardens. After today's presentation, what do you foresee doing in your spaces? So I have a complete list here of all the different actions that we learned about today. You may have some other ideas in mind, so feel free if you have something that you've done before or you've learned about recently, you can put that in the chat and share with all of us. Um, but take a moment, start to think about ways that you can make a difference yourself. So, while we're doing this, I just wanted to put in a little spring preview, um, some sustainable actions as we come up to spring, considering adding some plants that bloom early in the springtime so we can provide our overwintering animals and insects with that great food source. Pruning, once we are ready to prune our woody perennials, to prune at various heights um, so we have different diameter openings and this will help to support a diversity of all different types of insects. And then consider reducing the amount of turf grass or lawn space we might have within our landscape. So just a little preview. Um, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. I'd be happy to talk about some um, things we can do to support our wildlife and beneficial insects in the warmer months as well. Uh, let's see here. So final slide, I just want you to take away that to consider when you're in your landscape all the different animals that live within our ecosystems and that can benefit from the plants that you choose to add. So with this, um, with this fertility butterfly, think of me and my friends the next time you are in your garden. I have lots of resources here that I will make sure you all have access to. Um, some really great plant lists if you're planning for um, some new plantings. And yes, with that, I will. I would be happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see. We've got quite a bit. Lots of kudos for the presentation, Maddie. So thank you for that. Um, okay, the first question that we got was about where goldfinches over winter. Mm -hmm. um, to my knowledge, they are active during the winter season. So they're seeking food sources um, such as berries, nuts, and seeds. Um, I found a lot of photos of goldfinches seeking out dried seed heads as food in the winter time. Um, so to my knowledge, they're one of the active birds out in the winter months. And so if we can find ways to provide them with food, that would be great, like leaving our dried seed heads. 
Awesome. Um, so someone is asking kind of to follow up on that. So according to what they've learned, they're asking, should they not be deadheading their flowers in early autumn? Now, this is up to you. Um, as we should be doing as educators, we can provide people with the information, but it's up to you if you would like to deadhead your flowers or not. There's lots of different reasons my you may want to or not, um, but it's just good to know that if we do leave them, it'll be a great food source for a lot of our animals and it can help with reseeding for next season as well. Um, but awesome. some people find it easier for collecting seeds if you want to cut off that seed head and put it in a paper bag for drying too. Got it. All right. Another overwintering question. Folks are wondering where the black swallowtail caterpillars that were on their parsley are going for the winter. A lot of our native moths and caterpillars will overwinter in either that larval stage or they'll overwinter in the pupal stage. So they'll create a little chrysalis mm. or cocoon and remain in that leaf litter right below the plants typically to overwinter. Awesome. All right, so lots of leaf questions. If we grind up the leaves to use as compost, won't we be grinding up caterpillars or eggs in the leaf tiller? There is a potential for that. Um, so you're always weighing the pros and cons. I mean, you also have the potential of hurting these animals when you're walking on leaf litter. It's always mm -hmm. very tricky. So we do our best where we can to leave the habitat be. Um, but as we find with a lot of our arthropods, they're really tiny. So um, we shred mindfully if we choose to do that for our compost or we can leave the leaves whole, um, kind of weighing the pros and cons of that. Sure, makes sense. Um, oak leaves can take a long time to decompose, so is it better to shred them? Um, they can take a long time to decompose. So it's up to you uh, how fast you want that process to go. If you want a quicker composting time, you probably do want to break up the leaves into smaller pieces. Or as we saw with that leaf mold example, we could wait three years um, if we're patient enough and get some um, great decomposition. But um, there's also tips we can look up to help to um, encourage that decomposition process through mixing and so on. Um, if we don't want to shred, but that is an option. Got it. Okay. Does it help to use a lawnmower as soon as the leaves fall to shred them and to put them in garden beds? I have heard that that can be a, a great tip if we do it very soon after the leaves drop um, with the hopes that the overwintering insects haven't gone down into that leaf litter. It can be tricky, especially now as we're reaching toward the later part of our fall season, because we have a lot of layers of leaves that have already dropped down. Um, so just being mindful, if we have a lot of leaves in our landscape already, there's probably already insects in them. Um, again, weighing the pros and cons once we kind of do our research and know all the information. Okay. Um, regarding making brush piles, do some types of wood take longer to decompose? Um, probably, and I'm sure it has to do with a lot of the conditions as well as how dry that wood is, um, the climate that it's going to experience through that decomposition process. Um, I would say with our wood piles, a lot of people build them to last. Um, and so there are certain wood recommendations, can't remember off the top of my head, that tend to last longer if we want to keep that brush pile there for a while to provide that habitat for animals. But if you're looking at decomposing wood, um, that can take a long time. Um, typically has to be broken down quite a bit. Got it. All right, a couple of HOA related questions. Our community is filled with beautiful trees dropping oceans of leaves this time of year. I see we should only leave the leaves on 20% of our lawn area. I'm curious if there are recommendations for what to do with the remaining leaves that are not being left. Not sure if leaf piles would work here. Any other suggestions? Right now, a landscaping company comes and blows the leaves into huge piles and then carries them off. Uh, with that, I would recommend finding a place that they can be composted. Um, if you have a community garden that would take them, um, there have been a lot of compost collection organizations that have popped up, but community mm -hmm. gardens can be a great place to see if they're looking for uh, leaf mulch or compost. I know we tend to have more leaves than we know what to do with, um, but yeah. we can start to brainstorm and get creative with some alternatives. Okay, and 
Let's see. That's an that's I think there's a couple folks that had that question that are also working with their HOA to try to figure out how to keep leaves from uh, blowing out of beds who opt not to have them raked into people's yards or walkways or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, okay. Some states and municipalities compost the contents of leaf bags and make it available to residents. Does anywhere in Maryland do this? I'm sure there are. I don't know off the top of my head. I know in Howard County, we have what's called feed the green bin, where we have a green yep. bin in certain areas where you can have your yard um, trimmings and organic material picked up for composting, which is really great. Um, so I would just do a little bit of research for things local to your area. I know even DC has compost pickup subscriptions and organizations. Um, so I'm sure someone out there would be willing to take that organic material. Yeah, I would say it's very municipality based and some of them do um, offer compost to the public, especially if they have a composting collection service. Okay, um, you mentioned that leaves and yard waste and landfills are problematic because they produce methane gas. Would these not produce methane gas in compost piles as well? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, without getting too deep in the weeds with it all, um, I believe it's the anaerobic conditions that it experiences within our landfills. Um, so different conditions that it'll experience that in our compost piles, there's a particular bacteria that is decomposing within our landfills, and that is what creates this methane gas. Um, someone has more information about this, you can post it down below, but different conditions for our compost piles versus our landfills, which are piled in with all different sorts of materials. That mm -hmm. organic material gets underneath, um, doesn't experience the oxygen and anaerobic conditions. Methane's produced from this particular bacteria that composes it. Got it. All right, um, some pine needle questions. Is grinding up the pine needles bad? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Don't have a specific reason why they it would be bad to grind them up. There could be some insects or animals in them, but they're so much thinner and smaller that I think they're utilized less would be my guess than our whole leaves mm -hmm. would be. Um, so could be a great option to grind up those pine needles if you would like to. Cool. Okay, um, related, we have two very small oak trees and no pine trees on our property, nor do our neighbors. However, a nearby cemetery has loads of both acorns and pine cones. Is it a good or bad idea to bring some from there to our yard? Um, I don't think it would be a bad idea um, if you're interested in doing that. Um, could be a great experiment to see what happens. Um, as long as you have permission from a particular if it's privately owned property to remove that plant material, just um, making sure we're following the rules and regulations. I think it could be a cool idea if you don't have any pine cones or nuts yourself to move them to certain areas. Could be a cool thing to try out. Cool. Um, I just have a balcony near a tall birch tree dropping lots of leaves. Is there any benefit to the environment or wildlife if I just collect the leaves into a five gallon bucket and leave it out on a balcony all winter? Um, That could be a great thing to do. I'm sure some insects would find it and burrow themselves inside that bucket. Over time, you could have yourself some own, your own leaf mold or leaf compost. Um, so I think that could be a really great idea to keep it contained. Could be great habitat and compost eventually. All right, how deep or thick a leaf layer is too deep or what is the good recommended depth? So I mentioned with our vegetable gardens, um, anywhere from three to six inches is recommended. Again, it's gonna depend on what's in your vegetable garden. If you have empty soil that you don't have any cover crops or crops growing in them, really good thick layer could be great um, to help amend the soil to protect it. And then some people recommend if you still have an excess of leaves in the springtime that you can always then choose to remove those leaves or relocate them. Um, so if we ever find ourselves with too many leaves um, come springtime, we can always choose to remove them later. And then with our perennial plants, recommended about 
three to four inches or so, even less. Just being mindful of what your plant's preferred growing conditions are as these leaves can trap moisture in um, and around them. So it's going to really depend on your leaves, um, on your plants, I mean, as well, and what they prefer. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, last one. What about all the acorns that are dropping? Is it good to leave them? Yes. So we mentioned in today's talk about over 100 different vertebrate species feed on acorns. Um, so those are great to leave, especially because this year is a masting event year for many of us. So we have more acorns than usual. Um, and so this can be a really great feeds, food source for a lot of our animals in the wintertime. Awesome. All right. So that's 